Hello, everybody, and welcome to the presentation how to foster data sovereignty for OpenStack Cloud based on or with self-description. So what does data sovereignty mean? This means that you, as the owner of the data, have the control over your data, that you can decide in a self-determined way where and how your data is processed, where it's stored, and where, how it's, and where it's transmitted. And in doing so, you need some information about the properties of the provider, the service, or the resource, the data centers that host the service. And these, these information are currently not there, or if they are written somewhere, they are not written in a transparent way, in a machine-readable way. And this can be solved with self-description. You may know the term self-description from Gaia-X. Gaia-X is a corporation, a European corporation, which aims to foster data sovereignty. So it defines standards, concepts, architectures to establish data sovereignty. And we um, are inspired by that concept of self-description. We reused um, the self-description and extended a little bit to foster the data sovereignty. So what do we want to do? I will shortly explain you what self-description is. Then I will show you how you can use the self-description to foster data sovereignty. I will show you self-description for OpenStack-based clouds. I will show you the tool stack, and I finish the presentation with a conclusion. What are self-descriptions? I already said it. Self-description are machine readable standardized formats to describe the properties of clouds and cloud providers and cloud services. They are authored by the cloud provider. They are based on linked data principles. They are serialized in JSON-LD. They can be visualized as RDF graph. They are comparable because it's a standardized and machine readable format. And you can also sort and um, query self description with, for example, OpenSciF or Sparkle or Sparkle Star. A self description is based on a self description schema. And what is a self description schema? A self description schema is very, in, in a very simplified way, it's a vocabulary you have or which is available to write self descriptions. And it consists of two elements a taxonomy of classes, as you can see here. This is the taxonomy of classes. Um, you have a top level class, which is a Gaia X entity, and there are three base subclasses, a participant, a service offering, and a resource. A participant is an entity who offers or consumes service, so a provider or a consumer. A service offering is what the name says, it's, um, it's a service which is offered, and the resource is a building block for a service offering which is not available for order. And you need this building block in order to uh, describe your cloud service in more detail. This could be, for example, the data center where the service is hosted on. This could be the data itself, it could be the software. All these artifacts can be important for customers, so you need it, a, a way to describe these um, entities. And each class has, has a set of attested <coughs> attributes. The attributes can be optional or mandatory, and the mandatoriness is due to trust guidelines, and there is a special um, document, the trust framework from Gaia-X, which defines the attributes which have to be there in order to be Gaia-X compliant. And mandatory can also be due to technical guidelines. For example, a technical um, mandatory attribute is um, the service endpoint to access the service. And these properties are defined by a special sub-working group of a guy X. This is service characteristic working group. Here you see the self-description schema for a legal person. A legal person is a special subclass of participant. And what you can see is that we have three, three attribute groups which are mandatory, we have a legal address, we have a headquarter address, and we have a registration number. And the registration number is also subclassed by five different parts. So currently, Gaia-X supports the Lie code, the value added text ID, a local registration number, the, European, the economic or organization resource identifier, and the European identifier as a registration number. And you have an optional 
uh, attribute, this is a relationship, so that you can model the uh, parent and sub-organization relationship between legal persons. Here you can see a self-description for Cloud and Heat as a legal person. It's visualized as a very simplified RDF graph. What you can see is the subject in the middle, which is Cloud and Heat. And Cloud and Heat has two registration number, a local one and a value added text ID. And you see also the two mandatory attributes, the headquarter address, which is in Dresden in Germany, and the legal address, which here are the same, but there are organizations where the headquarter and legal address differs. How about data sovereignty? How can we use self-description in order to make it easy for the consumers to decide which cloud service to choose? And in order to look at these concepts, we have first to clarify how we identify subjects or entities in, in GAIAX. And this is done by W3C decentralized, decentralized identifiers, shortly DITs. What is it? DIT? The DIT is a URI that identifies an entity, and that an entity is in Gaia X a participant, a resource, or a service offering. And the DIT also associates a DIT document to that um, entity, and this DIT, DIT document contains more information about the entity. The DIT is always controlled by someone, and this is the participant in that case, and um, the participant, if the DIT identifies um, the participant. It's the participant who provides a service offering. It's a participant who maintains the physical resource or it's copyright owner of a, of a virtual resource. So GAIA-X divide two different types of resource, a physical one. This is a resource you can touch, for example, a data center or a virtual resource, which could be a data, a software, a license or something like that. The DIT document expresses metadata, cryptographic material, services, and verification methods for the DIT subject, and the DIT subject is a participant, a service offering, or a resource. And um, there is an important part in the DIT document for self-descriptions is the service part. What is a service? A service is an endpoint that, retrie that you can use to retrieve more information about this um, participant, the service offering, or this resource that it identifies. And we use these services to uh, retrieve a self-description. So when you have a DIT, you have a DIT document, and in the DIT document there is a reference how to retrieve the self-description um, with details about the entity which is identified by that DIT. The DIT document is stored in a DIT distributed DIT registry and you can retrieve the DIT document with the DIT resolver. There are um, a public available DIT resolver out there, and, and you give them a DIT. When you type in a DIT, you get the DIT document, and I uh, told you already that in the document there is a reference to the self-description, and that's how you get the self-description for a GIX entity, for a participant, a resource or a service offering. As soon as you have the DIT, you can retrieve the DIT document. And the DIT is a URI, as I told you, and uh, from, the, from, from the URI can also be, as you cannot always um, deduce the entity which is behind in URI, so that we have an onboarding process where you match the DIT to the entity in the, in the real world, so the DIT of Cloud and Heat to Cloud and Heat, which is identified by the DIT. How do we achieve data sovereignty? So I told you that we have, on the one side, the, the provider with the services, with the resources, and um, the provider defines the resource, the service offering with self-description, and on the other side, we have the consumer. And the consumer needs the information which are in that self-description. The consumer also knows how to retrieve the self-description, but there's no trust between these two parties. So how does the consumer know that things a provider is claiming about himself or his services or whatever are true? And this is solved with W3C verifiable credentials. How does that work? So when you have the provider and the consumer and they don't trust each other, you need a third party, both parties trust. And this is a conformant assessment body. What does this entity does? Um, it gets the claims from the provider, for example, the legal address, or 
um, the ISO certificate or that the service or the data center is hosted in Germany. All these claims are, um, are sent to the conformal assessment body and this is responsible for checking the integrity, the honesty and the completeness of that statement. And then it issues a so-called verifiable credential back to the provider and the provider stores it and can use this verifiable credential to prove a specific set of properties. Um, this concept is not new. We already have it in the physical world as well. So uh, imagine you want to prove or want to want to yeah, you want to prove another person that you are over 18. How do you do that? You uh, show the ID card you have, which is issued by the government, and the government is a trustworthy third party, is a, a conformity assessment body, and um, because you have this ID card, this tamper-proof ID card and the other person that you trust this IT card, you can prove that you're over 18. And this is the same in the digital world with W3C verifiable credentials. And the self-description is then just a set of verifiable credentials. So the provider decides uh, what verifiable credential you want to put in a self-description and then publish this self-description. How about the data sovereignty on the provider side? So it may be that the provider has some information you do not want to share with the entire world, but only for a closed user group. Uh, for example, um, a provider do not want to publish the entire architecture and software stack of his services um, unless there is an NDA signed. And in order to give all of the provider the possibility to decide with whom which he wants to share which data, we have um, developed the concept of a self-declaration. A self-declaration differs from a self-description in uh, two points. The first point is that the self-declaration is complete. That means it contains all information which are available of, about an entity. And the other thing is that the self-declaration does not contain the full verifiable credentials. So in the self-declaration does not, um, is not the full address listed, but just a reference where you can download, where you can retrieve the address. And the client can, when it has the self-declaration, can use that link and go to the storage of that verifiable credential and authenticate himself. And then when he is allowed to get this information, he, he receives the information. So the provider can now, for each verifiable credential, which is in the credential store, can define fine-grained usage policy, uh, who can access this information and who is not allowed to do that. How does this look like in a nutshell? So, I told you we start um, with issuing verifiable credentials. So the conformant assessment bodies issue the verifiable credential to a credential storage, and this is the organization credential manager. And then the provider defines the self-declaration and decides, okay, which credential do I want to have in that self-declaration for, for example, my organization, my service, my data center, my software stack, whatever. Then this is not good. Then um, this self-declaration is stored in a self-declaration storage. This is just a public available endpoint where you can download the file with the reference. The consumer knows the DIT of the entity and he wants to know more information about that entity. So he takes a DIT, puts a DIT in the DIT resolver, the DIT document is retrieved. In the DIT document, there is a link to the self-declaration storage where he can download the self-declaration and in the self-declaration are the links to the credential store to download the verifiable credentials if he is authorized to do that. How about self-description -des self schema for OpenStack-based cloud? Um, the schema is very complex, so I cannot present everything. I just uh, focus on three important parts. This is the jurisdiction of the provider of the cloud service. It is the locality, the physical locality or the physical location of the data center where the cloud service is hosted on and uh, the interoperability of the API of the cloud. The jurisdiction of cloud provider I already uh, showed you. So um, we have 
a service offering and a service offering had the mandatory association to the participant who provides that service offering. And the participant can be a legal person, can also be a natural person, but we are focusing on legal person here. Legal person, the legal person had this mandatory um, properties, headquarter and legal address. And with those two information you can um, deduce the jurisdiction, you can figure out uh, which law may be applied to the data which is processed or stored in that cloud service. Here you see the self-description for the OpenStack cloud, cloud and heat is providing. So there's a reference to cloud and heat and this I already showed you is the legal and the headquarter address of cloud and heat. How about the physical location of a data center? A data center is modeled as a physical resource in Gaia-X. And um, we have an um, aggregation between service offering and resource so that you can define on wh which, which resource your service offering is based on. And the physical resource is a subclass of the resource and has a mandatory attribute location which points to the country or more precisely the country code where the data center is located. And when we look at the cloud and heat OpenStack cloud, we have the aggregation to the data center and the location address is here points to the country code. That means, um, which is Germany in that case, so the data center of cloud and heat is located in Germany. And though the German law applies to the data which is processed there. Interoperability of OpenStack clouds. Um, this is also very complex interoperability, so I focused on two parts. This is the VMs and the flavors which are provided by the OpenStack cloud. And um, to model an OpenStack cloud, we have a special subclass called virtual machine. And um, the virtual machine is a subclass of service offering and has two mandatory attributes. There's a code artifact, which points to a virtual machine image with a lot of uh, properties and also at least one service flavor. And you can define the hardware requirements of that service flavor, for example, the memory requirements, network, the CPU properties, the GPU properties, and the same also for VM image. Here, this is a subset of um, the interoperability of Cloud and Heat's OpenStack cloud. For sure, we have more than two images and more than two uh, flavors, but um, in favor of visibility, it just uh, presented you these two um, to visualize how that self description can look like. So we have here images, we have the size of the image, the CPU architecture, the RAM size, we have the license, the copyright owner, and so on. And the same for flavor, that's not rocket science. How about the tool stack? So we need some tools in order to um, make these things happen. And there are already some tools out there. We have a portal. The portal is a web-based user interface to create credentials and self-declarations manually. So it's just a form where you type in all the information and then it outputs you the appropriate JSON files. There is a um, generator, a uh, self-description generator coming from the Southern Cloud Stack. This is a Python script or a bunch of Python scripts which generates credentials for the OpenStack clouds automatically. So what does this tool do? It takes a normal tenant block in and um, calls via the API um, the OpenStack cloud and retrieves technical information such as the flavor sizes, um, the VM image, the, pro the properties of the VM image, the volume types and so on. We need also a storage where we store the credentials in and this is the organization credential manager. And this credential manager also provides an interface to access these um, credentials and also to define the access policies. And we need a self-description storage. The self-description storage does not exist uh, currently, but it's just a simple. A web server can be a self-description storage where you can download a file, so it's not rocket science. Why 
what are our next steps? So I told you that most of the parts are aligned with Sky X, but some parts are not. So our next step will be to align all these parts with Sky X and also to give uh, the additional concepts upstreams. For example, this, the self-declaration part is not yet Sky X compliant, so we give this upstream this idea. What we also want to do is to implement a proof of concept of the thing you already said, so that um, you got from a did to a self-declaration and from the self-declaration to the self-description. And we do it um, as part of two projects, the TELUS project, it's a German research project, and as part of the Sovereign Cloud Stack. And what we also want to do is we want to extend the self-description schema. Right now, the sustainability and security features are not supported, and the, at least from our point of view, these are um, very important features which should be included in the self-description of a cloud service. That's all. And uh, now I'm happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Can you use a mic? Yeah. Um, you said that um, the self-descriptions are uh, the main focus is, uh, let's say, machine readability and stuff like that. Exactly. Uh, at the same time, you uh, illustrated quite well um, the complexity of these models. Yes. Um, does it work in practice? Uh, if the structure and the hierarchies and the interrelationships are that complex, then I would assume that it might be quite difficult for, for machine processes to find the information. Uh, honestly, I cannot answer the question because there is no uh, practice sur practical survey at the moment. We are just in the beginning. Um, but I, it's simply the same like the linked data, and the linked data also work as far as I know. Because the left description is nothing else the, um, than a big linked data um, file. So. Okay. So maybe a second question, if possible. Um, you said that you want to um, also extend the GAIA-X Federation framework uh, with your extensions. Uh, so uh, who's responsible for that? Who will accept this or will re reject this? What do you mean with GAIA-X uh, uh, framework? Do you mean, uh, I, maybe I go back. Do you mean the self-description scheme or do you mean the, the upper part that we want to align the concepts with GAIA-X? The upper part. The upper part. Who decides that? Is a technical committee who decides that? Um, the technical committee or the GAIA-X is divided into several, sub, uh, several working groups. Um, Cloud and Heat is part of that working groups. Um, so we um, bring this in the technical committee and then they decide hop or top or whatever. Okay, yeah. thanks. Other questions? This seems not to be the case. <laughs>